So for the 26th class, we began chapter 4 in your book, which is entitled The Mongol Moment and the Remaking of Eurasia. And just so you know, this is the final chapter of this 1200 to 1450 window of history that I hope you're learning some things about. So if you are absent, you will see here on Google Classroom there are three rectangles. Pretty straightforward catching up here. I am playing a full-length video in class, and I seldom do it. I don't think it's a great idea to do often, but once in a while, I feel it to be a positive. And this one in particular, I feel to be positive. Created by the British Broadcasting Company, it is excellent. So if you are absent, please watch this and answer the related questions here. Pretty straightforward. Now, this is an overview of this whole chapter. So for these two days, I hope you can walk away with understanding the broad schematic of the Mongols, the uh, general idea that we can slap some detail on over the next week or two. So on the second day, I gave this overview PowerPoint. So if you happen to miss the second day of class, let me go through this with you. So I'm going to begin with the word dominance or hegemony. The Mongols were dominant, like crazy dominant, but it didn't last very long. It was kind of short-lived compared to a lot of other empires. So let's start with the obvious, how big they were. I mean, monstrous. Look at this big orange swath of land going from Asia through the steppes, through Eastern Europe into the Middle East, into Southeast Asia. Absolutely enormous. 16% of the Earth's land mass was conquered by the Mongols. That's impressive. So I think we need to start off with just how big they were. Now, every great empire has a great leader. Genghis Khan was the unifier of the Mongol people. In fact, Genghis Khan is a title. He was born to Mujin. It means the king of kings. And he was the mastermind he, that brought the Mongols together and made them realize their potential, what they could do on a world level. And a primary source to reveal who Genghis Khan was Genghis Khan quoted, I am the punishment of God. If you had not committed great sins, God would not have sent a punishment like me upon you. If you call yourself the punishment of God, you're a bad motor scooter, if you know what I'm talking about. And he was. He backed this up, no doubt. So this is a pretty pronounced switch to be a military conquering empire to what the Mongols started off as, which were pastoral nomads. And pastoral nomadism, it's an effective way to live, but it's a hard way to live. You know, you're subject to the weather and you're following animals from place to place and you're not in a permanent place. You set up shop, animals eat the grass for a while, you do what you have to do there, and then they move on and you move on. And they switched from this pastoral life into a military force that was unstoppable. And it was Genghis Khan that unified them and made them realize, well, A, it's easier to um, conquer than it is to be pastoral nomad nomads. And number two, uh, we're good at this. And with their success, they got more confident and more confident, which caused that huge spread. And the Mongol weapons, the Mongols were skilled in all areas, great distance, close hand, but the thing that set them apart that made them almost impossible to defend against was their speed. The Mongol speed was something the world had never seen, and their horsemanship and their archery was stellar, and it was stronger than any force on earth. So when they showed up, a lot of times people, when they knew the Mongols were coming, just gave up, say, take what you want, just don't hurt us here. What do you want? Gold? You want this? Just, it's all yours. I don't even want to fight you because it's, it's not going to end well. And again, like I mentioned the horse, to the Mongols, the horse was paramount in their culture. And they had toddlers on horseback. So these were people who were the most proficient horsemen in the world, and they used it not only for military, but for currency and status and transportation. It was their be-all, end-all. You can't talk about the Mongols without the horse. Now, Kublai Khan, again, there was probably no greater leader than Genghis Khan to the Mongols, and he may have been one of the most effective world leaders overall in history. But Kublai Khan, his grandson, he was very effective as well. And he subjugated the Song Dynasty in southern China, and it made him the first Mongol to rule over an entire country. And it led to a period of prosperity for a long time. So Kublai Khan did his thing as well. 
And another thing we're going to learn about in the next couple days here is the religious significance of the Mongols. Because you can see here, as the Mongols spread, they broke into four parts, or khanates. And the khanates wound up taking different identities. So when the Mongol Empire broke up, it was this division that was probably at the root of it, but was left behind was different religious traditions that we still see in modern times. So anyway, the Mongols were highly tolerant of most religions and typically sponsored several at the same time. At the time of Genghis Khan in the 13th century, virtually every religion had found converts from Buddhism to Christianity and Islam. But where there was divisions the religion unified. So we're going to learn about this in more detail. So think of it this way. The Mongols were like this great wave and waves recede and what was left behind was a completely different world including uh, religion as part of it. Now Marco Polo, you know, Marco Polo was an Italian merchant, a Venetian merchant that traveled to China and he stayed for many many years uh, with the Mongols and he wrote this book, The Travels of Marco Polo and it sparked this interest in West-East relations that hadn't taken place since the Silk Road. So again, cultural diffusion, a term you hear almost daily in this class because it's, it's, it's instrumental in the historical story. So the West hanging out with the East and taking it back West. Marco Polo we will learn about in more detail in the next couple of days. And another important uh, historical aspect about the Mongols was their role in the bubonic plague. So in 1344, the Golden Horde decided to recapture the city of Kaffa from the Genoese. These were Italian traders. Now, this lasted until 1347, which was the beginning of the bubonic plague. An Italian lawyer recorded what happened next. The whole army was affected by a disease which overran the Tartars, which are Mongols, and killed thousands upon thousands every day. The Mongol leader ordered corpses to be placed in catapults and lobbed into the city in hopes that the intolerable stench would kill everyone inside. So the Mongols were at ground zero for the bubonic plague, which we'll learn about in more detail as well. And the Mongols, like I said, they did not last very long. And after the death of Kublai Khan, their great leader, the Mongol Empire stopped expanding and the decline became weaker. The, the Khanates, the division started losing control and the empire became corrupted. So it did not last very long. From bell to bell, we're talking about 150 years. So conclusion, and hopefully from these last two days, you have a good overview of the Mongols and their significance before you put some details into it. So the final main points. The Mongol invasions were among the most devastating invasions in global history. Few recorded events in history caused by human actions have been as destructive. Europe benefited from the invasion that it helped to lower prices and trade goods that now flowed more freely. New knowledge flowed to Europe and helped combine with shifting attitudes, which eventually launched the Renaissance. Okay, that's the upside. Okay, there's like most things, there's two sides to every coin. Now, the Middle East declined in political and economic power as depopulation had major consequences. Policies in China, in part, also adjusted based on experiences with the Mongols that led to new rulers in China to become, over time, more isolationist. So, that's a little egg heady. Let me try to simplify it. The Mongols were this incredibly huge wave that went through the world very quickly. And when they went back, the world will never be the same in terms of economics, in terms of disease, in terms of knowledge, in terms of military technology. These were game-changing people, and hopefully in a week or two you know the details of these game-changing people. So, thank you for watching.